we've sent more spacecraft to study the local environment on Mars than on any other planet. We have no evidence that life exists on the Red Planet, or ever did. But that didn't stop some people from wondering. Mostly because of the pictures that NASA's Perseverance and Curiosity rovers take regularly of Mars' surface. Feel free to check them out for yourself on the Internet. They're free for anyone to see. Over time, some odd shapes have appeared here and there in these pictures, making some people believe there is some sort of creatures living there already. Back in 2008, one of the rovers took a picture of a rock that looked very much like a female figure. Other photos seem to show animal-shaped figures, utensils or other Earth-like objects. Again, there is little to no proof of this theory, as rocks can be of all sorts of shapes and sizes. But if you look at the pictures, it does make you wonder. A lot of people in the scientific community do see Mars as a better place for long-term settlements, even though our moon is closer. Firstly, because it believed there is indeed water on Mars. It's just stuck in underground frozen lakes. The soil doesn't seem to be rich in nutrients, and it may have some harmful chemicals. Moreover, on the Red Planet, the gravitational pull is only 38% of Earth's, so it's easy to carry heavy objects here. On our Moon, for comparison, the gravitational force is only about 16 and 16th percent of that found on Earth. We already have people studying how we might live on Mars right here on our planet. It's because certain regions of Earth closely mimic the harsher conditions on Mars. Davon Island, for example, is the biggest uninhabited island on our planet, located in the Canadian Arctic archipelago. It's easy to see why it's hard to live here. The soil stays frozen all year. The eastern part of the island is covered by a thick ice cap all year round. Summers here only last for less than 50 days and aren't really that warm. Not a lot of plants can grow here, so no animals can adapt to thrive and multiply. As such, the Hutton Mars project started here in 1997 to offer astronauts unique studying opportunities. There are few options here in terms of logistics and transportation, and communicating with people living outside the island is also a bit more difficult. All because of the temperature and barren soil. Think about it, if we can find solution to live here, we might be able to do it on Mars too. Regardless of our local training, the conditions on Mars are currently inhospitable. That's because it's really cold. On average, the temperature is about minus 81 Fahrenheit. Even during the summertime, it's never hotter than 86 Fahrenheit. And to top it all off, the planet's atmosphere is made of 95 and 3 tenth percent carbon dioxide, so there's literally no way we could breathe there without special devices. Mars also lacks a magnetic field on its surface, so it is attacked by the sun's radiation. Because of the temperature variations, Mars often experiences powerful dust storms, which can surround the entire planet. Technically, these storms can physically harm us, but the dust might clog electronics and render solar-powered instruments unstable. We know now that life as we know it is impossible on Mars, but did it ever exist there? This is a question long debated by scientists, since NASA's investigations have determined that some parts of Mars were habitable at one point. We don't know for how long or how far back, and just because something could have lived there, it doesn't mean it actually did. Other recent photos from Mars showed a cloudy sunset. Does that mean it also rains on the Red Planet? Well, not really. For starters, on our planet clouds are water vapors, and once it starts to rain, the water reaches the surface of our planet in liquid form. This process isn't the same on Mars. Surprisingly, there is more water in Mars clouds, but they are made of iced water. Think of them as a tiny icy fog. Combined with the thin atmosphere and cold temperatures, it keeps the clouds from ever falling to the surface. Sunsets are different here too. According to NASA specialists, there is some fine dust that makes the blue near the sun's part of the sky much more visible on Mars, so the sunsets here have more of a bluish tint. Similar to Earth, Mars is also tilted on its axis, which means it also has seasons. 
because the southern hemisphere is directed away from the sun when Mars is farthest from it. The winters here are far colder and summers way hotter. Calendars work differently on Mars too. A year here lasts for about 1 and 8800 Earth years. A day is a bit more longer than 24 hours. Even if we were to ever move to Mars, we'd still have to communicate with our Earth. It would be a bit difficult to do, since a message sent back home would take about 15 minutes to reach its destination. It's not that bad, given the entire distance, but it would make video calls kind of annoying. As difficult as it might be for now to live there, there is a lot of stuff to see. Some scientists believe that if we were completely colonize Mars, a list of locations would soon be declared national parks, like the area surrounding Olympus Mons, which is the biggest known volcano in the solar system, stretching over 16 miles. Valles Marineris would be another cool location, it's been a huge complex of valleys about the distance from Los Angeles to New York. Mars also has some cool polar ice caps, which sometimes experience dry ice snowfall. Saturn and Uranus are unique planets in our solar system because of their rings. It may not have one now, but Mars may be getting a ring of its own in the future. Don't get too excited, it's estimated it might take 10 of millions of years. Mars' largest moon, named Phobos, will be torn apart at one point. The debris resulting from it will settle in a rocky ring around Mars, resembling that of Saturn and Uranus. Speaking of moons, Mars has two of them, that we know of. Apart from Phobos, there is also one more object called Deimos. Both were discovered by an American astronomer named Days of Hull back in 1877. The scientist had almost given up his pursuit to find Mars moons. But thankfully, he was urged to continue the project. The next night he stumbled upon Deimos. Six days after that initial finding, Hall found Phobos. These two space objects may be in fact some asteroids captured by Mars gravity. Another theory suggests they formed in orbit around Mars at about the same time the planet came to be. The fact that Mars has a really weak gravity may also be the reason for this fascinating event. Mars was hit by large asteroids many years ago, just like our planet was. A lot of that debris surely went back to the surface, but some of it was ejected back into space, as Mars' gravity wasn't strong enough to pull them back. They had quite a journey, some of them even ended up on Earth. These pieces of Mars also helped us understand the planet's unique features. We've continued to send robots to the Red Planet quite successfully in the past few decades. But it still remains quite difficult to imagine people will soon land on Mars. Even considering the current rocket technology, the journey would take us six months. And that's an optimistic scenario, given everything goes well on board. After landing, humans will be exposed to deep space radiation and microgravity. Both of these have serious effects on the human body, which we've yet to figure out how to counteract. That's why research is continuously performed on the International Space Station regarding the long-term effects of microgravity. The Grand Canyon in Arizona is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. You could even fit the whole of Manhattan in there. It's so massive, it kind of has its own weather. But the Grand Canyon isn't the only big crack out there. The Valles Marineris is bigger, way bigger. It's on Mars, and it goes nearly a quarter of the way round the planet. It's ten times as long as the Grand Canyon, and it's so deep, you could parachute into it. The Kesai Valles is also on Mars. It's made up of a series of canyons, and it might be the ancient home of a massive Mars flood. There are huge canals and canyons all over the Red Planet. There's Tiu Valles. That's where researchers think there was an epic battle between ancient Martian water and boiling hot volcanic lava. Guess we know who won that one. Equally impressive is Ares Valles. It's the longest known drainage system around. It might be weird to think of Mars as having huge waterways, rivers, and floodplains, but in its early days, Mars might have had a warm and wet climate. 
Now it's just dried up canyons as far as the eye can see. The Ithaca Chasma looks like a giant scar on Saturn's moon Tethys. It's four times longer than the Grand Canyon, and about three times as deep. And it's billions of years old. No one's been kayaking there yet. We've only seen a photo of it, thanks to the spacecraft Voyager 1. Mercury's Great Valley makes the Grand Canyon look like a tiny pothole. NASA's Messenger spacecraft was the first to snap some photos of this massive formation. The valley's surrounded by two giant somethings, the Enterprise and Belgica, whatever that means. Pluto's largest moon, Charon, has a canyon named Argo Chasma, and it's huge. Even though Pluto's not called a planet anymore, it can still brag about its huge canyon. Even right here on Earth, the Grand Canyon has some serious rivals. Yarlung Tsangpo Canyon is the deepest canyon on Earth. It's in the Himalayas, in Tibet. Some people call it the Everest of Canyons. You could fit a 2,000-story building in it. The Indus River Gorge is big and gnarly. It's in Pakistan, and you could stack three football fields inside it. The Indus River, one of the largest rivers in Asia, passes through it, and it's even home to baleen whales and porpoises. The Colca Canyon in Peru is a short but insanely bumpy bus ride away from Machu Picchu. It's the massive home for the largest flying bird in the world, the Andean condor. It has a wingspan of 10 feet. In Nepal, where the Himalayas are, is the spectacular Kali Gandaki Gorge. No one knows exactly how far down it goes, but it's probably around five times as deep as the Grand Canyon. It's got it all. Crazy terrain, thin air, and it's in the middle of nowhere. So beware, only experienced hikers should dare go in. The Copper Canyon in northern Mexico is home to a world-famous group of people who run marathons, or even double marathons, just for fun. There are six canyons all joined together, and in its widest part are two of Mexico's tallest waterfalls. Copper Canyon also has one of the longest zip lines in the world, and one of the scariest train rides you'll ever take. Don't look down. Even in the US, there's a lesser known canyon that's deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's Hell's Canyon. And it's sort of on the border between Oregon and Idaho. It was carved out by the Snake River. Hell's Canyon is home to the Seven Devils mountain range. The King's Canyon is in the Yosemite National Park area. It's about one and a half times as deep as the Grand Canyon. Nearby is the second largest tree on Earth, General Grant. The largest canyon in Australia is the Caperty Canyon, and you can get paid to go there. Mm, sort of. A few lucky cyclists and campers over the years have found gemstones on the banks of the Caperty River. If you're lucky, you'll also see some 2,000-year-old rock art. The Tiger Leaping Gorge is right out of a fairy tale, but it's very real, very deep, and pretty scary. The legend says that a tiger was being chased, and it leapt over the river at the bottom of the gorge, with a little help from a perfectly placed rock right in the middle of the river. The Great Rift Valley is 15 times longer than the Grand Canyon. So what, that's like a trillion miles long? It goes through two continents and is home to about 30 lakes. It's even visible from outer space. So if you're ever floating out there in the cosmos, keep an eye out for it. The Kota Hawasi Canyon is deep, very deep. It has extreme rafting, kayaking, and hiking. And apparently the mosquitoes are pretty extreme too. There's one canyon in Tibet that I'm pretty sure holds a world record. Try looking up the Polong Tsangpo Canyon. No images pop up. It's 2021, that's insane. What's down there? Yeah, probably just a river and stuff. Colombia's Chickamauga Canyon is pretty much as deep as the Grand Canyon. Extreme sports own this place. Zip lining, canoeing, paragliding. Heck, even their cable car is extreme. It's a 25-minute ride, and it's steep. 
Under Greenland is the Greenland Grand Canyon, and it goes for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Water from melting icebergs runs through the canyon. It was actually NASA who discovered it. There's an absolutely massive canyon in Antarctica. The only problem, you can't see it. But apparently, it's freezing cold and mostly white. The sea has some mighty canyons too. The Zemchuk Canyon is one of the biggest underwater canyons. It's right off the coast of Alaska, and it's home to seals, dolphins, and whales. The deepest underwater canyon is about six times as deep as the Grand Canyon. It's the famous Mariana Trench. Make it to the bottom, and you'll break the world record for deepest dive ever. The Grand Bahama Canyon is another underwater marvel. You could just keep dropping Empire State Buildings in there, and you'd never see them on the surface. Monterey Bay is pretty laid back, but its canyon is anything but. There's lanternfish, squid, sea turtles, rockfish, and sea otters all hanging out together. Oh, and thousands of jellyfish, so take care not to get stung too much. There's also giant kelp around there, a seaweed that can grow up to 100 feet long. The Hudson Canyon runs from the New York Harbor right into the sea, and it's gross. Sure, it has deep sea coral and sponge formations, but it also has a whole bunch of trash and sewagey sludge coating the bottom. The Aviles Canyon is off the coast of Spain. It's one of the deepest underwater canyons in the world, and it's one of the few places where giant squid live. It's famous for its white coral and the fact that it's insanely cold. Bremer Canyon in Australia is underwater, massive, and dangerous, especially if you're a giant squid. That's the favorite snack of the local orca, the huge whale with a monster appetite. Bremer Canyon's a major tourist destination these days, especially for those looking to snap a pic of the more than 100 orcas that call it home. The Nazare Canyon is near Portugal. It's the largest submarine canyon in Europe, and it's around three miles deep. That's six of the world's tallest buildings. It forms high breaking waves, so it's become a haven for big wave surfers. The Canadian Arctic Rift System is huge. It goes all the way from the Labrador Sea to the Arctic Archipelago, and it connects the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans. So picture this. Greenland used to be smashed up against Canada some millions of years ago. Thanks to this rift system, Greenland's been slowly drifting away. Think how huge Canada would be if you added Greenland onto it. You wake up in your ultra-modern dwelling, go out on the balcony, and admire the incredible sandstorm in the distance. The reddish wall is approaching and has already reached the parking lot where your shiny Starship rocket stands. When the storm subsides, you put on your spacesuit, get in your rover, and drive to work. Your job today is to monitor the instruments in the freshwater extraction plant. In the evening, your shift ends and you return home. The cooking robot has already prepared dinner, fried potatoes, grown right here on Mars. This scenario could be true as early as 2050 and even sooner. Elon Musk plans to send a million people to Mars by then. Very ambitious, but incredibly difficult to accomplish. Flying to Mars is very expensive and time-consuming, and it consists of several stages. We're heading to the launch pad, where the first Starship is being prepared for takeoff. The rocket consists of two parts. The first is the Super Heavy Booster, It'll help the heavy craft overcome the Earth's gravity and leave our planet. It should take Starship into orbit, then undock and land back on Earth. At that time, Starship has to hover in orbit, having used up almost all of its fuel during takeoff. The next step is to refuel Starship right in orbit. The booster takes off again from the launch pad and carries fuel for the main spacecraft. Starship is still empty because we don't want to spend a lot of fuel to lift it out of orbit. So now, it's time for another booster rocket to carry a payload for Starship. Food, construction materials, and research equipment are stacked in the cargo bay. All set at last, our spaceship sets off on its long journey towards Mars. 
this is how just one ship is planned to be launched. But it can only hold 100 people, while we're planning to send a million there. That's almost half the population of Brooklyn. That means we'll need at least 10,000 ships for the whole mission, and even more booster rockets to refuel and send cargo into orbit. Considering that one starship costs about $8 billion, this mission would cost a pretty penny. The key to solving this problem is reusing these ships. Once the ship has delivered people to Mars, it should be refueled and sent back to Earth for the next batch, sort of a space bus. Another problem is time. The orbits of Earth and Mars aren't perfectly circular. They're of different lengths and make circles around the Sun at different speeds. When Earth and Mars are at their farthest apart, the distance between them is about 248 million miles. And the closest distance, when the Earth is perfectly between the Sun and Mars, is 34 million miles. This is our target. Once every 26 months, Earth and Mars meet at this distance. So this is the perfect time to launch a rocket to keep the flight time as short as possible, between 6 and 8 months. If the first flight is scheduled for 2025, and we plan to complete the mission in 2050, we would only have 12 such flight windows. We would need to launch at least 833 ships in each window. Then there's weightlessness. On a trip to Mars, astronauts will spend more time in zero gravity than people now spend on the International Space Station. Without gravity, people's muscles weaken. Even the distance between their vertebrae slightly increases. So, during the missions, astronauts actually become a bit taller. Throughout the voyage, the team will have to constantly train in the gym to be ready for the hard work upon arriving on Mars. In addition to ships with people on board, cargo ships will also be needed. When people arrive on Mars, they will need to build an entire city from scratch. Construction materials, tools, machines. The massive cargo Starship can take on board is about 75 tons. That's about 30 SUVs. So we'll need a lot more ships to get everything we need. And that doubles the cost of the whole mission. There's a cheaper way to get to Mars though, the Gateway Station on the Moon. It's kind of like the ISS, only it orbits our natural satellite. It'll also have many modules for astronauts, living bays, storage bays, docks for ships, and research units. The whole point is that it's much easier for a spaceship to launch from such a station because there's no gravity. And then the ship doesn't have to use an incredible amount of fuel to leave the Earth's atmosphere. It took about $100 billion to build the ISS, and building Gateway could be even more expensive. But it should save us money in the future. The small Orion spacecraft will lift astronauts from the surface to the station. Then, after preparation, the astronauts will go on a long journey to Mars. Let's go a little bit forward in time. The first few ships have delivered their load on the surface of the Red Planet. Beach umbrellas and deck chairs will have to wait, because it's time to build the city and prepare for the arrival of the next group of people. The priority is energy. For this, we can use solar panels, like on Earth, or nuclear power plants. The next step is to build houses. Because of the lack of atmosphere on Mars, nothing will protect us from the sun's radiation. So a great option is to build houses underground. Now we need to take care of water extraction. There are ice caps at the poles of Mars. We can take water from there. Then oxygen. Plants have to help us do that. There's a lot of carbon dioxide in the air of Mars which serves as a kind of food for green plants. And as a waste product, they release oxygen. All we have to do is collect this oxygen and use it to breathe. Sooner or later, the food we bring with us will run out. So we'll have to grow food directly on Mars. This requires fertilizers and greenhouses. Now that everything else is taken care of, the main task is to produce fuel. We need it for vehicles on Mars and for rockets to be able to return home. Fuel can be extracted from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and water. All this has to be done in completely unfamiliar conditions. Gravity on Mars is three times weaker than at home. You'll be able to jump higher and lift heavier objects. 
but prolonged exposure to such weak gravity can harm our bodies. Now that there's a whole city on the planet's surface, it's time to turn Mars into something more comfortable, resembling Earth. This is called terraforming. We need to increase the pressure in the atmosphere so that water can exist here not only as a vapor or ice, but also in liquid form. We also need to raise the temperature of the surface. Our goal is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Right now, it's about negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit on average there. Then, we need an ozone layer, like on Earth. It should protect us from solar radiation. Finally, we can start creating the biosphere. That's all living organisms, plants, and animals. Gradually, Mars will start to resemble Earth in its best years. For all this, scientists have come up with many solutions. For example, a large asteroid could be dropped on the surface of Mars. This would warm up the atmosphere and bring more water and gas there. The planet could also be populated with different bacteria. In laboratories on Earth, scientists have simulated conditions on the surface of Mars and realized many bacteria can survive there. As long as they live, they can release oxygen and other gases into the air. Besides that, we can build biodomes. This is a kind of greenhouse with favorable conditions. Life will develop in it, and the soil of Mars will gradually become suitable for life. And one of the easiest ways is the greenhouse effect. On Earth, it contributes to global warming. But on Mars, gas emissions from cars and factories can help create an atmosphere. Optimistically, it could take 300 to 1,000 years to change the face of the red planet. Other scientists say it could take millions of years. Only then will humans finally be able to take off their spacesuits and oxygen masks and call Mars home. <laughs>